Hi, I'm Peter Boyce. I'm a Constitution course instructor with the Institute on the Constitution. I'm going to be speaking about Article 5 and the dangers of triggering an Article 5 constitutional convention. Uh, I'll begin with a, with a little joke. A congressman is walking down the street and a guy steps out of an alley, puts a gun in his rib, says, give me your money. The congressman says, well, you can't have my money. I'm a United States congressman. The gunman thinks for a moment and says, well, in that case, give me my money. There's uh, a lot of ill sentiment across America about our federal government being out of control. Uh, $17 trillion debt, of what they show us, um, undeclared wars and open borders and on and on. And uh, there are those, both on the left and the right, that insist that the only way these problems can be resolved is with an Article V convention. They call it a convention of the states, or a conference of the states, or whatever name it's given, if it's motivated by two-thirds of the states passing resolutions calling for a convention as per Article 5, then it's a constitutional convention. And we'll get to that. So let's begin. Let's see. From Psalms 11.3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And what is the foundation of America? The foundation of America, in spirit, was best expressed, I believe, by John Quincy Adams, our sixth president. He said, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. Now, that's not to say that we are, per se, a Christian nation as meaning a, a theocracy. We're not a three, theocracy, but our foundation is certainly the uh, Judeo-Christian uh, ethic, and uh, for the most part, predominantly, yes, we're a Christian nation. Calvin Coolidge, President Calvin Coolidge, no other document devised by the hand of man ever brought so much progress and happiness to humanity. In our short history, just over 200 years, we produced more wealth in goods and services and happiness and sent out more missionaries than all the other nations of the world combined throughout history. And that was no accident. It's based on the principles upon which we're founded. The United States Constitution defines America. As America's foundational document, the Constitution is the very structural embodiment of Lady Liberty. Established upon the rock of these self-evident truths affirmed in our Declaration of Independence. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator, God, with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that governments are instituted among men to secure these rights, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. But there are those that which, which to change America, fundamentally change America. Let me go back. Where are we? Here we are. We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Why would someone want to fundamentally transform the United States of America that has been a blessing upon the world? How will this be accomplished? How will a fundamental transformation of America be accomplished? What would be the venue? The only venue capable of precipitating structural changes sufficient to fundamentally transform America is an Article V convention. The Article V authority placed in the hands of self-interested delegates could be the undoing and untimely death of Lady Liberty, something the founders never intended. Upon exiting the convention, Benjamin Franklin was asked by a woman what have you given us, sir? His reply was, a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it, indicating without eternal vigilance, we could lose our republic. We are on the brink right there now. Thomas Jefferson, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. What would that transformation be? From a republic that secures our individual unalienable God-given rights to a socialist state wherein the sovereign citizens would be reduced to mere subjects, their God-given rights reduced to state-granted revocable privileges. What is an Article V constitutional convention? Now, from the Constitution, this is Article V. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution. Or, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments as part of this Constitution. 
oh, for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by conventions and three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress. This is the portion, this portion in red, is what we're concerned about here with regards to an Article V convention. There are two ways to amend the Constitution. The first way that Congress proposed the amendments and then ratified by the states, that's how we, we obtained our 27 present amendments, the first 10 of which were the Bill of Rights. The second mode on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states to call a convention, that has only happened once in America's history, and we'll get to that. Here we are. There has only been one constitutional convention in the history of America. It was convened for the, quote, sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation is what got us through the Revolutionary War, but they were not very adequate. The delegates to a constitutional convention, however, are vested with sovereignty. Thus, unrestrained, the delegates chose in 1787 to discard their mandate to simply revise and amend, deciding instead to scrap the Articles of Confederation altogether and to replace them with an entirely new document, our present U.S. Constitution. The delegates even went so far as to change the rule for the new document's ratification. Whereas the Articles of Confederation required unanimous ratification by all of the states, the delegates knowing they would have some trouble with a few of the states, reduced the ratification requirement to only three quarters of the states as what is now per Article V. By the grace of God, these delegates were God-fearing men who had just fought off the British at great personal sacrifice of life and blood and treasure. They gave us our present Constitution. But what nature of men would be appointed as delegates today? Now, this is Michael Farris. Now, remember the words of uh, President Obama. We, in five, we are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Now, everyone would recognize that the President Obama is more on the left. Now, here's Michael Farris. He's the head of the Convention of States Projects that's pushing for an Article V convention. He is supposedly on the right. That's, oh, excuse me, excuse me. Because sometimes what you need is not a change of personnel. You need a change of structure. Sometimes what's needed is not a change of personnel, but a change of structure, meaning those in Washington that ignore the Constitution, they're not the problem. The problem is the Constitution, which they're ignoring. Change of structure. To fundamentally transform America would require structural or constitutional changes. A Lady Liberty is on trial here. The charges against the Constitution, incompetence irrelevancy, inadequacy. What evidence is presented? Those who swear to defend her instead dishonor her, disrespect her, and ignore her. What will be the sentence if she's found guilty? She'll be put on the Article 5 operating table or, as in the Articles of Confederation, executed altogether, scrapped. What ectomies will be performed on our Bill of Rights? It's unknown. Who the delegates will be? It'd be the surgeons unknown. Her accusers, Michael Farris, Convention of the States Project, Mark Levin, radio talk show host, Mark Meckler, Rob Nadelson, the Goldwater Institute, Raymond Lotta of the Revolutionary Communist Party USA, now we're getting into those from the left that are, that are pushing for an Article V convention, the tax-exempt Ford Foundation, which paid for the production at the cost of $25 million dollars this document here, they have an entirely new constitution drawn up waiting to replace our present constitution. Interesting to note, there's an entirely new branch of government, among others, the regulatory branch with a regulatory czar that will create, that will control all economic enterprises. And its rules for ratification won't even go to the states. It will go to the uh, public referendum. Anyway, let's continue. Um, Tax exempt Ford Foundation, Wolf Pack, funded by George Soros. There are many uh, resolutions being pa uh, going through the state houses, uh, calling for the repeal of um, uh, uh, I'm having a, I'm having a a great okay okay. Now 
those that are pushing for a convention, the Convention of the States Project people, they say, oh, this isn't on Article 5, this isn't a constitutional convention, even though it's per Article 5, even though it requires 30 uh, resolutions from two-thirds of the state legislatures. So regardless of phraseology, whether it's called a constitutional convention, a con-con, a convention of the states, COS, conference of the states, or amendment proposing convention of the states, etc., whatever name you give it, A, if it is powered by resolutions from two-thirds of the state legislatures, then it walks like a duck. B, if it calls upon Congress to convene a convention to amend the U.S. Constitution pursuant to Article 5, then it quacks like a duck. Then by definition, it is an Article 5 constitutional convention. There is no other venue for a constitutional convention. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. It's a con-con. It's a constitutional convention. And don't be deceived by that or tricked by that play on words. What sort of men purchased our liberty with their blood and drafted our U.S. Constitution? These men testify to both the character and competence of Lady Liberty. What were their principles? What were their beliefs? What was their understanding of human nature? What were their morals? Because these were the values and the wisdom they manifested in the document they drafted, our U.S. Constitution. George Washington, he presided over the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Quote, the government can never be in danger of degenerating so long as there shall remain any virtue in the body of the people. When it really comes down to it, what's necessary is a revival in America. But that revival cannot pl take place very easily if our First Amendment is lost, if our freedom of speech and religion is lost. Samuel Adams. While the people are virtuous, they cannot be subdued. But once they lose their virtue, then they will be ready to surrender their liberties to the first external or internal invader. That's about where we are now in America. President John Adams, our Constitution was made only for moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. What people don't realize is that the Constitution is not law to govern the people, but rather to govern the government. It's the Ten Commandments which are to govern the people. Self-restraint. Samuel Adams again, neither the wisest constitution nor the wisest laws will secure the liberty and happiness of a people whose manners are universally corrupt. Sam Adams again, the liberties of our country, the freedom of our civil constitution are worth defending against all hazards, and it is our duty to defend them against all hazards. Abraham Lincoln, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. Another quote from Abraham Lincoln, don't interfere with anything in the Constitution. That must be maintained, for it is the only safeguard of our liberties. Edmund Burke, the essence of freedom is the proper limitation of government. Now he's speaking to the point I made just a moment ago, that the purpose of the Constitution is not to control the people, but to control the government, to limit the government, thereby leaving the people free. Thomas Jefferson, same sentiment. In questions of power, then, let no more be said of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. Unfortunately, they're ignoring the Constitution. Daniel Webster, hold on, my friends, to the Constitution and to the republic for which it stands. Miracles do not cluster, and what happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. Hold on to the Constitution. George Washington, the Constitution is the guide which I never will abandon. Sam Adams, let each citizen remember at the moment he is offering his vote that he is executing one of the most solemn trusts in human society for which he is accountable to God and his country. And that's where the buck stops. The buck stops where the American people have been so dummied down they don't have a clue as to what the proper criteria for a candidate is. If they don't understand the proper functionings of our government under the Constitution, how can they possibly elect qualified candidates? Now that was the caliber of men who purchased our liberty with their blood, drafted our sacred U.S. Constitution, and secured our republic for future generations. Do we still have that caliber of men in our state legislatures? This is New Jersey. Now I'm from New Jersey, so th these are some of the people that I selected. Can we trust them to be or even to select wise, God-fearing delegates worthy to rewrite our Constitution at an Article 5 convention? The leadership of the state legislatures will pay, play a key role in the selection of delegates, whether in New Jersey or any other state, 
it is not about Republicans versus Democrats, seeing as neither obey either the U.S. or even their own state constitutions. Now, I can go in depth as to the violations of New Jersey's constitution, but time doesn't permit. These are just a few of the problems Americans are being led to believe an Article 5 convention could solve, and these are also the existing constitutional solutions. I'll point them out. A growing federal debt, okay, $17 trillion, this is what's published, it's far greater than that. All they need to do is obey Article 1, Section 8. This would reduce government costs by 80%, balance the budget overnight. Illegal immigration. They need to do their duty under Article 4, Section 4, which states, quote, to protect the states against invasion, 20 to 30 million illegal violators of our border, that constitutes an invasion. Oppressive environmental regulations. There's no constitutional authorization for the EPA even to exist. States must stand up and interpose themselves between the people and the federal government's usurpations under the 10th Amendment. That's called nullification. No win wars. The Constitution requires a declaration of war by Congress, not by UN resolution. Abortion. It has divided the country deeply. Article 3, Section 2 empowers Congress to limit the federal, ju the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, which if they had the backbone, all these so-called pro-life congressmen who get elected and re-elected because they're pro-life, if they actually solve the problem, they'd lose their meal ticket to the next election. If they exercise the power they swore to in Article 3, Section 2, and limit the, the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. They return the issue to the states where pro-life groups could fight it out on a level playing field and at least end the abomination in some states. Money being devalued through inflation. The Constitution requires Congress to coin money and set the value thereof. The Fed's creation was unconstitutional. That power to coin money and set the value thereof was vested in Congress. They had no, no right, no authority to transfer that to a group of private bankers, the Federal Reserve. Common Core, there's no constitutional authorization for the federal government to be involved in education or health care for that matter. The states must step up and interpose themselves with the Tenth Amendment. Energy dependency, there's no constitutional authorization for the Department of Energy to even exist. States must interpose themselves again for their citizens as their natural right and duty. That's just a few of the solutions that already exist under the Constitution. We don't need to change it. As America's condition is critical, is there a malignancy in our U.S. Constitution requiring Article 5 surgery? Or is the problem in the hearts of those who we the people elect? Do they show the duty, honor, and the spirit of country? No, they don't. Do they honor their oaths? Now this is a, uh, a clip of Mark Levin. As I said, when we have elections, we're not electing whether to comply with the Constitution or not. The Constitution isn't up for election. These individuals we elect have taken a solemn oath to uphold the Constitution, and they refuse. They will not do it. So here's Mark Levin, one of the primary advocates of an Article 5 convention, part of the Convention of the States, saying that the problem is they don't obey the Constitution. Well, if they don't obey the Constitution, why is he uh, so gung-ho to put it on the Article 5 operating table and change it? He admits the problem is they don't obey it. If amending the Constitution would cause those we elect to obey it, we could solve all the problems in the world very easily. We just amend the Ten Commandments. Would amending the Constitution cause those we elect to obey it any more than amending the Ten Commandments would cause thieves to stop stealing, liars to stop lying, or Bill Clinton to stop doing what he does? If the defects are not in our nation's constitution, but rather in the hearts of those we elect, why the big push for an Article 5 convention? Do we, the people, elect and re-elect scoundrels to rule over us out of ignorance of our constitution's provisions and of our sacred founding principles? Sam Adams, mankind are governed more by their feelings than by reason. Thomas Jefferson, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. They point out violations of the Constitution, declaring that it has been changed by those violations, insisting that an Article 5 convention is the only way to correct it. Now here's uh, Mark, is the Mark Levin. The Constitution's been rewritten and mangled and amended left and right by all three branches of the federal government. The Constitution has been 
rewritten, mangled, and amended by all three branches of the federal government left and right. Really? We have 27 amendments, the first 10 of which being the Bill of Rights, ratified in 1791. That means in over 200 years there's only been 17 amendments. All of those amendments were proposed by the Congress and ratified by the states, none of which were the result of the Supreme Court or the executive branch. That is a bold-faced lie. It's an, an emotional argument intended to stampede people that would, which don't know any better into calling an Article V convention. Here's Mark Meckler. They've been twisting it and squishing it and turning it and tearing it and using it as a weapon against us for decades, right? For a very long time. Again, the indication is because the Constitution is being ignored, being violated, that somehow it's been changed. It has not been changed. Because sometimes what you need is not a change of personnel. You need a change of structure. You're saying because it's not obeyed, it needs to be changed. Mark People Levin again. People say, don't you support the Constitution? Why do you want to change it? I love the Constitution. I revere the Constitution. It's been changed. I call this a post-constitutional period. Quickly, an example, Obamacare, obvious. Congress passed a law it didn't even have the power to pass. The President of the United States signed a law he didn't have the power to sign. The Supreme Court upheld a law that is blatantly unconstitutional. They twisted the statute, changed the language of the statute, rewrote the statute, and this is going on all the time. But did it change the Constitution? No, it didn't change the Constitution. It violated the Constitution. So why the big push to change the Constitution? Why the big push to put the Constitution on the Article V operating table? Government's violations of the supreme law of the land, the Constitution, like ignoring traffic laws, may have disastrous results, but that does not change the law itself, even if done repeatedly. Here's another clip. Now, if they have a better idea, then I want to hear it. Well, we do. Because they don't have a better idea. Moreover, what I'm talking about is in the Constitution itself. It was sanctioned by the framers of the Constitution. It was sanctioned by the states. It's in the Federalist Papers. They strongly endorse it. I didn't write the Second Amendment process in Article 5. The framers did. And they did it for a reason. They did it for this occasion, the occasion we're involved in right now. Of course the people in Washington, D.C. that man the bureaucracy, that run the Capitol building, that live in the White House, that uh, rule from the Supreme Court, of course they're going to reject everything I say. Of course they're going to reject this part of Article 5, like they reject so much of the United States Constitution. That's what they do, and that's what they've been doing for a century. What I'm saying is, at a minimum, we must inform ourselves about what the framers gave us. They gave us this. I said at the beginning of the program, what is our recourse to a Supreme Court decision? Well, guess what? We have one. What is our recourse to Obamacare? Well, guess what? We have one. What is our recourse to a massive bureaucracy that steals our private property? shuts down our businesses and interferes with our workplace. Well, we have one. Well, this is the nature of the very uh, compelling, emotional, emotionally charged arguments that are being used. Unfortunately, they're not based in truth or fact. The better idea, obey the Constitution. That would be novel. What recourse? Nullification under the Tenth Amendment. States standing up and interposing themselves, as is their duty, between the federal government's usurpations of power and their citizens of the state. It's in the federal, Federalist Papers? Yes, it is, as a warning. Notice they don't quote the Federalist Papers. Strongly endorsed? We're going to hear the strong endorsement given by James Madison. You'll be surprised at how he could ever construe it as a strong endorsement is beyond beyond reason. For this occasion, no. There's also a quotation by James Madison saying that the purpose of Article 5 was to correct errors. There is not one quotation from any founder saying that the purpose of Article 5 was to rein in an abusive government that ignores the Constitution. Not one. D.C. is against it? Really. Just as uh, the, uh, those that were pushing to create the Federal Reserve System pretended 
to be against the Federal Reserve Act, that this was a way to rein in the big bankers. And the Constitutional Convention is a way to rein in big government. They were the ones that drafted the Federal Reserve Act to begin with. They were pushing it. But they knew that if they came out on the side uh, promoting it, it would never be passed. So they pretended to oppose it. Same technique is being used today. Here's James Madison. Yes, it is spoken of in the Federalist Papers. Funny how the COS crowd never seems to uh, quote the Federalist Papers. Here's one reason why. This is James Madison, Federalist number 43, speaking about Article 5. Quote, it moreover equally enables the general and the state governments to originate the amendment of errors, as they may be pointed out by experience on one side or the other. The amendment of errors, never to rein in an, uh, an abusive government that ignores the Constitution. Now they say one of the arguments they use is that, well, an Article 5 convention will be completely controlled by the states. The federal government, Congress, will have nothing to do with it. They'll have nothing to say about it. It'll completely be controlled by the states after Congress calls the convention. Well, there's Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 22 of the United States Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 empowers Congress. That's the portion that empowers Congress. And this is, these are the words. Congress is empowered to, quote, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. Now, Article 5, the calling of a convention, that's another power. That's one of the other foregoing powers. They will control every aspect of the convention, every detail of the convention. You can be sure of it. They will not give up power easily. In 1788, James Madison, father of the Constitution, ensured the readers of the proper role in Federalist 45. The powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. The Tenth Amendment, all powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. This is the power that the state governments have to stand up and interpose themselves between the federal government and the people. This is called nullification, and this is what they need. But in order to do that, they need to develop a backbone, and we need to make sure they do. So the choice is, do we drink the Con-Con Kool-Aid, or go, do we go with the recommend what the founders recommended, nullification, the states standing up? Okay. Constitutional Convention versus nullification by the Tenth Amendment. Now, with regards to the Supremacy Clause, people will say, well, the United States Constitution is the, uh, the law of the land. It's the supreme law of the land. Well, this is a quotation by Thomas Jefferson. Get this question cleared up. But it will not follow from this doctrine that acts of the large society, meaning the federal government, which are not pursuant to its constitutional powers, but which are invasions of the residuary authorities of the smaller societies, the state governments, will become the supreme law of the land. These will be merely acts of usurpation and will deserve to be treated as such by the states. Hence, we perceive that the clause which declares the supremacy of the laws of the Union, like the one we have just before considered, only declares a truth which follows immediately and necessarily from the institution of the federal government. It will not, I presume, have escaped observation that it expressly confines this supremacy to laws made pursuant to the Constitution which I mention merely as an instance of caution in the convention, since that limitation would have been to be understood, though it had not been expressed. Meaning, he's saying, this is obvious to you guys, that the states are to stand up when the federal government passes laws that are usurpation, that are beyond their, their delegated powers. Now, this is the effect they're having on state legislators. Um, Lori Sain, representative for Colorado, 63rd District, Weld County. Well, we're doing exactly what our founding fathers expected us to do. And uh, Article 5 was actually the last closing argument of the very last Federalist paper. And uh, if there was a runaway government or a runaway Congress, our founding fathers expected us to use Article 5 to redress any of those grievances or those wrongs. So we as state legislators have a lot more power than we, than we think. And this caucus is certainly addressing that issue. She obviously hasn't read Federalist 85, and she's parroting what she's been told by the Convention of States crowd. Well, this is what Alexander Hamilton actually said in Federalist 85. Um, 
A nation without a national government is, in my opinion, an awful spectacle. The establishment of a constitution in time of profound peace by the voluntary consent of a whole people is a prodigy, to the completion of which I look forward with trembling anxiety. I can reconcile it to no rules of prudence to let go the hold we now have in so arduous an enterprise upon seven out of the 13 states and after having passed over so considerable a part of the ground to recommence the course I dread the more the consequences of new attempts because I know that powerful individuals in this and in other states are enemies to a general national government in every possible shape. Did I miss something? Did that sound like an endorsement? They'll point to, they'll say it's in the Federalist Papers, but they will not quote the Federalist Papers because the founders were against using Article 5 to try to rein in an abusive government. Nullification. There's Thomas Jefferson. Now this is, the, this is the proper remedy here. In cases of an abuse of the delegated powers, which is what we have, the members of the general government being chosen by the people, a change by the people would be the constitutional remedy. Hmm? I like guys like Ron Paul. But where powers are assumed which have not been delegated, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy. Where powers are assumed which have not been delegated, which is the problem we have now, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy. Not putting, article, not putting the Constitution on the Article 5 operating table, not changing the rules when they don't obey them. And that the co-states, recurring to their natural right in cases not made federal, will concur in declaring these acts void and of no force and will in each take measures of its own for providing that neither these acts nor any others of the general government, not plainly and intentionally authorized by the Constitution, shall be exercised within their respective territories. And this works. This is how the Real ID Act was, was stopped. Here's Michael Ferris. This is interesting. I sure hope this clip plays. Let me just start with a preface. Anybody that considers himself a friend of the Constitution of the United States and says that our Constitution was illegally adopted has defamed the Constitution of the United States. And I don't know why in the world they consider themselves a friend of the Constitution. It is not true, and it is not loyal to the Constitution of the United States. Well, this man carries a lot of credibility. He's the, he's the founder of Patrick Henry College. Now, here he is again. Among the other domestic enemies of the Constitution are those who argue that it was illegal. That's an, to me, that's an enemy of the Constitution. So let me tell you the real history of the, uh, of the adoption of the Constitution. You've heard that the Constitution uh, Convention was called for the limited purpose of amending the Articles of Confederation. Well, that's not true. Okay, now, keeping in mind, this is Michael Ferris. He's the head of the Convention of States Project. He's the one spearheading this. He's the founder of Patrick Henry College, and he just said that those that would say that our Constitution, uh, that the delegates to the, to, the, to the 1787 Convention exceeded their authority are enemies of the Constitution. Okay? Here's Patrick Henry, the namesake of uh, Mike Farris's college. Patrick Henry in 1787 said, I would make this inquiry about those worthy characters who composed a part of the late federal convention. I have the highest veneration for those gentlemen, but sir, give me leave to demand, what right had they to say we the people? Who authorized them to speak the language of we the people instead of we the states? The people gave them no power to use their name. That they exceeded their power is perfectly clear. The federal convention ought to have amended the old system. For this purpose they were solely delegated. The object of their mission extended to no other considerations. Get it? He just called Patrick Henry an enemy of the Constitution. Well, they can't both be right. One of them is an enemy of the Constitution. And it's not Patrick Henry. Here's Mark Meckler. He's also one of the ones spearheading the Convention of the States. What do you expect the states to do? What do you expect these states to come up with? And uh, second question, um, I believe, and I may be incorrect, that the first convention of the states was supposed to modify the Articles of Convention, and you said that they didn't step outside of their bounds. Um, I think I would contend that that's not true, since they instead wrote an entire constitution. Um, can you answer those questions, please? So it's just historically...
this this is a what I would call kind of an urban myth that has developed that that was a runaway convention. Okay, he's calling Patrick Henry a liar. Because sometimes what you need is not a change of personnel. You need a change of structure. Okay, those that ignore the Constitution, they're not the problem. The problem is the, is the document itself. That's what they would have us believe. Uh, endorsed by the framers, not hardly. Mark Levin and his CONCON -con team always seem to somehow overlook this endorsement of the new convention by the father of the Constitution, James Madison. I wonder why. Here's James Madison, the father of the Constitution. He said, quote, you wish to know my sentiments on the project of another general convention? I shall give them to you with great frankness. If a general convention were to take place for the avowed and sole purpose of revising the Constitution, it would naturally consider itself as having a greater latitude than the Congress appointed to administer and support as well as to amend the system. It would consequently give greater agitation to the public mind. An election into it would be courted by the most violent partisans on both sides. It would probably consist of the most heterogeneous characters, would be the very focus of that flame which has already too much heated men of all parties, would no doubt contain individuals of insidious views who under the mask of seeking alterations popular in some parts but inadmissible in other parts of the Union might have a dangerous opportunity of sapping the very foundations of the fabric. Under all these circumstances, it seems scarcely to be presumable that the deliberations of the body could be conducted in harmony or terminate in the general good. Having witnessed the difficulties and dangers experienced by the first convention, which assembled under every propitious circumstance, I should tremble for the result of a second meeting in the present temper of America and under all the disadvantages I have mentioned. Well, gee, that doesn't sound like a strong endorsement. That sounds like a very stern warning. And he said, he concluded by saying, by saying, I should tremble for the result of a second meeting in the present temper of America. Now that was 1788. The men, these are God-fearing men, I just fought off the British for the price of life and blood and treasure. They gave us our present constitution and he should tremble in that temper. He could not imagine what it would be like today with the special interests, the major media, the United Nations. Let's see if I can get that off the screen here. Where's the the major media, special interests? It would be a free for all. It would be a shark, a socialist shark feeding frenzy on our Bill of Rights. Benjamin Franklin expressed similar sentiments regarding another con constitutional convention. "Quote: I doubt." Oh. Oh, where are we? Okay. I doubt too. Whether any other convention we can obtain may be able to make a better constitution. For when you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, their local interests, and their selfish views. From such an assembly can a perfect production be expected? It therefore astonishes me, sir, to find this system approaching so near to perfection as it does. And I think it will astonish our enemies who are waiting with confidence to hear that our councils are confounded like those of the builders of Babel and that our states are on the point of separation, only to meet hereafter for the purpose of cutting one another's throats. He was that serious about it. For this occasion, no. It was to correct errors as per James Madison, the father of the Constitution, and never meant to rein in abuses of government that ignore the Constitution. Paraphrase what he says. Mark Meckler uh, stands up and says, uh, Colonel Mason may have said something like this at the convention. He says something like this, and then he goes on to say about um, how it's, it's necessary to use Article 5 to rein in an abusive government. I, I'm sorry this clip isn't playing here. Oh, boy. But anyway, um, here's what Colonel Mason actually said, and these are from James Madison's notes of the convention. Now, they point to Colonel Mason as uh, endorsing the use of Article 5, when in reality, here's what he said. Now, James Madison says, Colonel Mason thought the plan of amending the Constitution exceptionable and dangerous, as the proposing of amendments is in both the modes to depend in the first immediately and the second ultimately on Congress. No amendments of the pro proper kind could ever be obtained by the people if the government should become oppressive, as he verily believed 
would be the case. And this is the case we have now. And he's saying there's no way that we could get amendments. Under such circumstances, there are no way that we can get amendments out of a convention that are going to be beneficial. Yet that is exactly what the opposite of what Mark Meckler is saying he said. I'm sorry I can't get this clip to play. Okay, D.C. bankers are against it. The D.C. powers are against it. Uh, this is interesting. I was originally very skeptical of amending the Constitution by the state convention process. I, like many of you, was concerned it could turn into a runaway caucus. And as an ardent defender of the Constitution who reveres the brilliance of the fame framers, I assumed this would play disaster into, uh, disastrously into the hands of the, fra of the uh, statists. But today, I am a confident and enthusiastic advocate for the process. The text of Article 5 makes abundantly clear that there is a serious check in place. Whether the product of Congress or the state convention, a proposed amendment has no effect at all unless, quote, ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by the conventions in three-fourths thereof. This, ladies and gentlemen, should extinguish anxiety that the state convention process could hijack the Constitution. It is impossible. It is impossible. Really. There's a new state's constitution waiting in the wings to replace our present constitution. This is one of several constitutions uh, that have been drafted just waiting at different special interest groups want as the new constitution. The new, this new state's constitution was prepared with funds from the Ford Foundation, $25 million over the course of 10 years. And um, just as the delegates to the 1787 convention changed the rules for ratification, this one also changes the rules for ratification. It won't even go back to the states. Mark Levin is saying it's impossible because of, of any uh, bad amendments getting passed because it's going to go back to the state legislators assuming we can trust the state legislators that they're any more uh, uh, faithful to the Constitution or to the principles that were founded on than those in the federal government. But just as the delegates changed it in 1787, the rules of ratification, the delegates changed it here, and don't, it doesn't even go to the states, it goes to a public referendum. Now here's uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice Warren Burger in response to a letter from Il Phyllis Schlafly uh, asking, is it possible that a constitutional convention could be limited uh, to one issue, one subject, one amendment? Here's his answer. I have also repeatedly given my opinion that there is no effective way to limit or muzzle the actions of a constitutional convention. The convention could make its own rules and set its own agenda. Congress might try to limit the convention to one amendment or to one issue, but there is no way to assure that the convention would obey. After a convention is convened, it will be too late to stop the convention if we don't like its agenda. The meeting in 1787 ignored the limit placed by the Confederation Congress, quote, for the sole and express purpose, end quote. With George Washington as chairman, they were able to deliberate in total secrecy with no press coverage and no leaks. A constitutional convention today would be a free-for-all for special interest groups, television coverage, and press speculation. Our 1787 Constitution was referred to by several of its authors as a miracle. Whatever gain might be hoped for from a new constitutional convention could not be worth the risks involved. A new convention could plunge our nation into constitutional confusion and confrontation at every turn, with no assurance that focus would be on the subjects needing attention. I have discouraged the idea of a constitutional convention, and I am glad to see states rescinding their previous resolutions requesting a convention. In these bicentennial years, we should be celebrating its long life, not challenging its very existence. Whenever, whatever may need repair on our Constitution can be dealt with by specific amendments. These are other constitutional scholars and, and groups that are opposed to a constitutional convention. Supreme Court Justice Arthur Goldberg, Lawrence Tribe, Professor of Constitutional Law, Harvard University, Professor Charles E. Rice, School of Law, Notre Dame, Professor Gerald Gunther, School of Law, Stanford University. Professor Charles Allen Wright, School of Law, University of Texas. Neil H. Kogan, School of Law, Southern Methodist University. Professor Christopher Brown, School of Law, University of Maryland. Professor Jefferson Fordham, College of Law, University of Utah. Rex E. Lee, President, Brigham Young University. 
The 69th Annual Convention of the American Legion introduced a resolution publicly opposing any efforts to convene a constitutional convention. And that's just a few. Trust the state legislatures to uh, understand our founding principles, resist federal enticements, and only ratify amendments which will defend God-given rights or appoint those delegates who will? Oh, really? They don't even obey their own state constitutions. This is uh, Steve Sweeney, president of the New Jersey Senate. Very powerful man. He might very well be a delegate to the convention. A new convention, is, a new constitution is already drafted. It's waiting in the wings. It's patterned, this is patterned after the UN Charter. Interestingly, there are several new branches of government, one of which is the regulatory branch. And I'll from, read from section one of the new state's constitution. It also reduces the number of states from 50 to 10. Section 1, there shall be a regulatory branch and there shall be a national regulator chosen by a majority vote of the Senate and removable by two-thirds vote of that body. His term shall be seven years and he shall preside over a national regulatory board. Together they shall make and administer rules for the conduct of all economic enterprises. I think we have uh, regulations now. You know, just interesting little uh, cartoon I found when politicians say bipartisanship what they really mean is both parties will work together in helping themselves to taxpayer cash. States, on the average, are already addicted to 35 percent of their budgets being carried by grants from the federal government. Can we realistically count on them to shut off that spigot, which provides the socialist freebies enabling them to get reelected without directly raising taxes on their state's voters? Not hardly. We cannot count on the states to protect us in the, in the convention. If by some miraculous event the convention were to come up with a, an amendment not authorized, then Congress would have the right, in fact the duty, to refuse to specify a mode of ratification. And since Congress is an institutional rival of the convention, it'll have every motive to try to reign in the convention if the convention acts in any way which is impermissible. Okay. Let's unpack what he just said. What he said is that nothing to fear because if the states try to uh, propose amendments which are going to increase the power of the federal government, then the Congress is going to step in and, uh, and not permit that. Oh, really? They're going to, they're going to insist that their, uh, their power be reduced. I don't think so. Now. Let me just finish up here by making a few points regarding the runaway scenario, the claim that if, um, uh, if we ever had a convention like this, it uh, uh, could be a constitutional convention which could do anything it wants, could want Korean out of control, uh, take over the country, presumably come and kill all your puppies, whatever. That's the danger. That's the only danger he sees. He can come and kill all our puppies. Could the convention change the method of ratification? No. No. Even though the only precedent in America's history, the Convention of 1787, did change the mode of ratification. And if all of that wasn't enough, I would like to remind you that there are the possibility of lawsuits all along the line. Anything that the convention does that is even arguably legal can and will be challenged in the courts. And contrary to what you may have heard, the courts have been willing to accept Article 5 disputes. So he's saying, no fear, no fear. It'll be challenged in the federal courts. When it's challenged in the federal courts, what court is it going to go to? It's going to go to the Supreme Court. Oh, we can trust them. We can trust them. Or liberal groups might very well sue or to try to throw a monkey wrench into the convention and the, with the same results. Liberal groups might try to sue, throw a monkey wrench into the convention. You can be absolutely certain. Uh, that liberal, liberal groups are standing in the wings just waiting for a convention to be triggered uh, to see that uh, their agenda is implemented. You can bet that they will sue, and it'll be before the Supreme Court. Our Constitution will be put in the hands of the Supreme Court. Now, there are other enemies of the Constitution, enemies of America. There's Vladimir Putin from the KGB. 
Uh, he would be interested in uh, seeing our pesky constitution revised to be more harmonized with the United Nations. Mara Strong pushing Agenda 21 globally. He'd be interested in our constitution being changed to, to suit his needs. George Soros is presently funding Wolfpac uh, pushing uh, for the Article 5 Constitutional Convention. Here we have Bill Gates. I'll play this clip of Bill Gates. He's pushing Common Core. But let's, let's take a look. Uh, first, we've got population. Now, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. He just, he just calls for the elimination of over a billion people without even taking a breath. And he's the man pushing Common Core. He would have an interest in seeing that our pesky constitution uh, is out of the way. Okay, now, with regards to Common Core and Bill Gates, 46 states have already accepted the grant money to implement Common Core, sight unseen. So... Can we count on those states holding the line against the federal government? Would they be giving that money back that they received from Common Core? Or is it more likely that the states will propose whatever amendments will more firmly establish Common Core to bring even more largesse from the federal government? They will not be sending their delegates to the convention with the purpose of reigning in the federal government. They'll be sending their delegates to the convention with the purpose of bringing home even more bacon. Okay. Uh, sacred principles upon which the U.S. Constitution is established are stumbling block to the globalist plans, uh, America's enemies. Psalm uh, 2, 1 to 3, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And that applies to the Constitution. Here's a quote from David Rockefeller. This is, his own words. For more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum have seized upon well-publicized incidents to attack the Rockefeller family for the inordinate influence they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as, quote, internationalists, and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure, one world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and am proud of it. Those are his own words. The Constitution stands directly in the way of his globalist plans, that our rights come from God and the purpose of government is simply to secure those rights. That is uh, anathema to the United Nations. This now is... Um, Raymond Lotta of the Revolutionary Communist Party, USA. Let me get this to play here. Oh, file. Okay, can't find the file. So we'll continue. These are some of the liberal groups. Uh, I'll just go through these pages quickly. These are liberal groups that have already gone on record stating that they support an Article 5 Constitutional Convention. Funny how the media isn't saying anything about uh, this uh, sweeping across the country through the state legislatures. These are hundreds, literally hundreds of groups on the left, mm -hmm. radical socialist groups, communist groups, gay rights groups, abortion groups, Okay, now here is a, a clip of uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So this is, uh, gives us a glimpse into how well that we will be able to uh, rely on our Supreme Court when ultimately these lawsuits uh, challenge uh, the direction of the Constitutional Convention as being too conservative and uh, it ends up in the hands of the Supreme Court. Now, keep in mind, this is the same Supreme Court that ruled that Obamacare is just a tax. The court that ruled to remove prayer and the Ten Commandments from the public schools 
while etched in stone in the very chamber that they're sitting in is Moses holding the Ten Commandments. These are the ones that we're going to be counting on to defend our God-given rights. Other countries' constitutions, maybe the United States or other countries, as a model, or we come up with our own methods and our own uh, draft? You should certainly be aided by all the constitution writing that has gone on since the end of World War II. Um, I would not look to the U.S. Constitution if I were drafting a constitution in the year 2012. I might look at the Constitution of South Africa. Yeah. You can be sure that our new constitution will not be modeled after our present constitution. And let's see. Okay, new Consti state constitution. I spoke about that already. Uh, and I'll end with this little uh, cartoon. And uh, I don't know if you can, if you can see it. It's uh, Mark Levin holding a, a thin little leash, saying it's totally safe to open the Concon's gate. See, we have a leash on it. Impossible that it would run away. I want to thank you for your attention, and uh, please contact your state legislators and tell them to oppose any efforts uh, to that urge them to call an Article Five Constitutional Convention, whether it's from the Convention of the States people or, or from the wolf pack uh, or any other groups pushing for an article 5 convention it would be the end of our united states constitution and that which defines america thank you and god bless america